Gracious Heavenly Father, I just come into your presence by means of our Lord Jesus Christ and in the Holy Spirit, thankful for the opportunity that you've given us to continue feasting upon your word. I just ask that you would filter out all the foolishness and all the ignorance, but seal to our hearts that which is truth. For it's in Christ's name I pray. Amen. Hi, this is Steve at BlessedHopeForever.com. And we've been studying together in the Epistle to the Romans, verse by verse, and we're in the 15th chapter, somewhere around verse 5. Now, I'd like to begin by reminding you here of the fact that we've had 11 chapters of doctrine, and apart from that doctrine, we can't possibly understand what we're to do. It is doctrine which delivers us, saves us, as well as them who hear us. And so I'd like you to, to keep that in mind as we go through this epistle. And there's another thing that I want to point out that I believe is, is extremely interesting, at least it, it is to me. If you've followed this ministry, this channel, for any length of time, you know that we place a tremendous e emphasis on the gospel being that which what Christ has done for us. This is the, the gospel of Christ is our proclaiming what Christ has done, not what man must do. And so when we look at the, the monergistic gospel as opposed to the synergistic gospel, which focuses on man and what man must do, we see that the gospel is very much about what God has done for us, which precedes any action on our part. It is because Christ died in our place that we believe, receive, accept, repent, etc. Now I understand the issues that that raises with many, many Christians as it concerns the matter of free will. But I assure you, that based upon the authority of Scripture and based upon the truth of God's Word, this is what the Gospel teaches. The Gospel teaches that we don't believe, receive, accept, repent, etc., so that Christ's death and resurrection will somehow be applied to our lives. His death in our place was substitutionary. It was not provisionary. We were spiritually dead, totally depraved. We learned this at the very beginning of the epistle. And so what I want to point, direct your attention to here is the fact that, is that the structure or the arrangement of the, this epistle itself actually mirrors the gospel of Christ itself. Because when we look at the outline of Romans, chapters 1 through 11, we see what God has done for us were that the rest of the epistle is what we do because of that. Now, I hope I explained that correctly. There's another thing that I want to point out, and that is, is that we live in a society, in a world, we're surrounded by a world religious system that its entire focus is on just what I just described, and that is the synergistic aspect of not only the gospel, but our relationship with Christ. That we're under law, that we're not under grace. That we judge one another and we accept one another based upon human merit. And what I want to point out to you folks is that unless we are free from the burden of ourselves, we cannot possibly become burdened for others. It's just a fact undeniable fact of Scripture. So I'm going to go through this with you. I, maybe you'll see this on the screen. I hope you do. It could be that you won't, but it, I'm going to try to make this available for you to see on the screen here. I spent some time, I have spent some time here recently going over uh, verses 5 through 13, which is where I believe that we're at in our present study. And what I've seen uh, through prayerful study and meditation over these passages is I've seen a, a tremendous emphasis 
on God's Word, His faithfulness, the finished work of Christ, the importance of unity, a leveling the playing field, so to speak, and I'll, I'll talk more about what I mean by that here in a moment. Ministry toward one another, worship, our enduring in circumstances that we can't control, God's comfort, joy, and peace, and hope, and all of that through our believing God, which I've said on numerous occasions, I believe that the what God desires most of us, more than anything else, is that we trust Him. Now, if you remember when we began this chapter at verse 1, we looked at, uh, and I'll just go ahead and read the first few verses. We then that are strong ought to bear the infirmities of the weak. The word is infirmities. Just as a reminder, we're looking at a situation in which this is not describing a physical illness. I believe that the text or the context confirms the fact that the infirmities of the weak is something that is mental, something that is intellectual, and to not please ourselves. And Scripture, as I've pointed out, it defines the strong and the weak, the strong being those who uh, we consider uh, every day alike. Um, they have strength. Uh, they're strong in the sense that they uh, feel that they can eat all things. Uh, they don't really have any scruples, any uh, personal convictions as to what's, what's right or wrong. They understand that God has created everything uh, for our enjoyment that we're not under law but under grace, but there are those who are weak who don't have the faith to eat all things, and we are not to force, the strong's not to force the weak to go against his conscience, because to him, if he regards something as being unclean, then to him it is unclean, and whatsoever is not of faith is, is sin. And we, we, I spent some time covering that that we're to let every one of us please his neighbor for his good, that is the good. Uh, in the original text, the word his is not there. The good, which I believe refers to the word of God itself. So the emphasis is on the word. For even Christ pleased not himself, but as it is written, the reproaches of them that reproached thee fell on me. For whatsoever things were written aforetime were written for our learning, that we through patience and comfort of the Scriptures might have hope. And I pointed out that the word patience there is the word endurance. And so we're looking at a situation in which, in, in view of the stronger and the brothers, uh, the weaker brothers' relationship with one another, it's a situation in which we don't have control. I think that's important to take note of here. Because the tendency is to think that in the relationship between the weaker brother and the stronger brother, that we can, these are situations that we can control. We control it in the sense that, you know, the stronger brother uh, will impose his, uh, his, uh, what should I say, strength upon the weaker brother as well as the weaker brother will take and, and criticize the stronger brother. These are situations that we can't control, and for good reason. The reason why we can't control these situations is, is simply because there are stronger and weaker brethren. So it's through patience and comfort of the Scriptures that we might have hope, and I pointed out that hope is guaranteed expectation. It's not wishful thinking hope in the worldly sense of the term. Now the God of patience and consolation grant you to be like-minded one toward another according to Christ Jesus, like-minded, that you may with one mind and one mouth glorify God, even the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now folks, this like-mindedness is not a doctrinal statement. You know, I, I believe that even on our website we have a doctrinal statement the main reason that's there is to show everybody that we're not charismatic, you know, that we're conservative. But I'm sure that you're uh, 
aware of the fact that, that many churches have a doctrinal statement. And that's a great thing, except the problem with that sometimes is that if you're not in agreement with that doctrinal statement, and I've been in, invited to, to speak at many churches where that I could not be in agreement with that doctrinal statement, then in their mind at least, uh, you're not of like mind with them. Uh, you're outside that sphere of like-mindedness. And of course we know that that's not what that, the text here is talking about. We're to be like-minded one toward another according to Christ Jesus. So that's not, it doesn't say like-minded one toward another according to a doctrinal state or a personal set of beliefs. Now if that were the case, uh, well, their common sense tells you that there would never be any like-mindedness. We would never, there would never be any possibility of being one mind, uh, that we would all be with one mind and, and, and with one mouth glorify God, even the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. So what we see in verses 5 through 6 is the God of constancy, the God of comfort, desire. We see that it is the Holy Spirit's desire. You see that in the grammar. His desire is the prolonged gift. That's, uh, I take that from the definition of the word in the text. The prolonged gift of thinking, judging, and caring for one another as it concerns the finished work of Christ in one another. And therein lies the exists the unity that we have uh, among one another in, in simple very simple terms folks our like-mindedness our having one mind and with one mouth glorifying God is centered around the person in the work of Jesus Christ it can be no other way it's the it's it's almost I, what I find m amazing about this is, is that in one fell swoop, God eliminated any possibility of our like-mindedness or our being of one mind glorifying God. Uh, he eliminated any possibility uh, of that being anything other than that which is based on the truth of God's Word where it's, it's, it's all centered in the person and the work of Jesus Christ. It's the only place that, that true unity can exist. And you have Christians today talking about how that we need unity. And, uh, well, the statement in and of itself is true. We do need that unity. But the, the, the real truth of the matter is, is that that unity does exist. It's not that we need something that's not there. It is there. We just need to be involved in what is there. And so it's based upon that that we're to receive one another as Christ has received us to the glory of God. That's verse 7. And what a statement. Stop and think about what that's saying. We receive one another on the same basis that Christ received us. It's the same word. You have uh, our receiving one another as Christ also received us. You have the same word there in the text. It's the exact same word. I receive you in the exact same way that Christ received me. How did Christ receive me? Did he receive me based upon uh, my performance? Did he receive me based upon merit? Uh, is, in so many Christians today, they receive or accept or reject one another based upon what they perceive to be uh, some qualifying factor. And, and, of course, the text completely eliminates that. It completely rules that out. There's something else that could be said about the word receive. If you look at that word uh, receive, the word is proslambano in the Greek. And the word literally means to aggressively receive with strong personal interest. Now, I don't know how many, I don't know about you, but I have, I have never seen legalistic, legal, uh, law-minded, law-oriented, fleshly-oriented Christians going about aggressively receiving with strong personal interest others who are of like mind. Now, you may, you may argue, uh, you may differ 
with that and say that there are those who do. But it's, I think the text is clearly showing that there is a, a, there is a difference between our aggressively receiving with strong personal interest those for whom Christ died in, in, whom, in which he received them the same way uh, that he, he received you the same way that he received me. That we're looking at Christians who are receiving one another based upon the way that Christ received us. And it, it is an aggressive uh, reception. It's almost, the text almost seems to scream out here that we are actively, aggressively seeking out, not just receiving, but seeking out those who are of like mind uh, with strong personal interest. That's what the text seems to be saying. And so we, we come to verse 8. Now I say that Jesus Christ was a minister of the circumcision for the truth of God to confirm the promises made unto the fathers. I think the text is clear in, in what it's saying. The truth of God is manifested in the obedience of Jesus Christ. And it was confirmed by God speaking the truth to the fathers. Otherwise, he lied. I think it screams out the, the trustworthiness, the faithfulness of God, that God is faithful, that he keeps his promises. And so... Now we've got a promise-keeping God brought heavily into the text here. Now verses 9, uh, 10, and 11, and 12, we've got the next four verses that, that goes back, and we're looking at what's been written. And so uh, let's spend a little bit of time talking about that. Now here's just what I saw in these verses. I'll, I'll let you read through these yourselves. But in verses 9, basically 9 uh, through 12, what I saw here is that God's mercy results in glory. It's his mercy. And people have asked me over the years, they've said, Steve, what's the difference between grace and mercy? Well, grace is simply... Our, our getting what we don't deserve, whereas mercy is our not getting what we do, which basically is hell, judgment, condemnation. And we see in these, in, the, in these quotes here that God's mercy results in glory, a true estimation of his worth, as I pointed out, a true estimation of Christ's value. Uh, praise, the word praise, is out of confession. It's the same word, the word praise there in the text. Our speaking the same thing that God says, homilageo, it's the same word, homilageo, that we saw, uh, and I pointed out in, in just a recent video, if not the last video, uh, it's the word that for confess that we see in 1 John 1, 9, which is not naming our sins, but saying the same thing that God says about our sin, which is, praise God, God has forgiven us our sins. Uh, it's the word homilageo, speaking the same thing that God says. Rejoice. That, that word rejoice is to put in a good frame of mind. Uh, and I'm always contrasting law and grace, but I've got to point out that I've just never met uh, very many uh, Christians who were, uh, in, with, in all the, with all the Christians that I've met, who, bur who are carrying around the heavy yoke of burden or slavery uh, to the law, who don't realize they're standing in Christ, who are trying to become acceptable to God based upon their, their own human performance, I've never really seen them in a good frame of mind. Everything here, folks, that we we're looking at, everything here is points away from self to Christ. Uh, and it focuses on what God has done, where that our response follows, which is really little more than believing, uh, praising. Uh, it's a uh, 
if, if you are looking at the chart that I put on the screen here, what you're going to see is you're going to see that, that I've underlined in red, these, these are from my study notes, I've underlined in red what God has done, and in, in blue, it's uh, basically it's a, it's a, the color-coded, the difference between red and blue is red is what God has done, blue is what we do, just to put it quite simply. And so it's, we see an emphasis on his deity in the, in the phrase root of Jesse, he being the Messiah, uh, rise, the word rise. So there's the emphasis on his resurrection. Reminds me of Job 14, 7, for there is hope of a tree, if it be cut down, that it will sprout again and that the tender branch thereof will not cease. So uh, though he should fall like an aged tree, his name and family will not be extinct. A descendant will rise and reign over the Gentiles, the root and the offspring of David. So again, you see a reference to the resurrection in the text in which God's promises assure us of his resurrection and his living forevermore. There's a lot of genitives there in the last verse. Now the God I hope fill you with all joy and peace and believing that you may abound in hope through the power of the Holy Spirit. Uh, Holy Ghost, if you're looking at your King James, uh, never liked that word ghost. The word is pneuma in the Greek, it's spirit. Uh, to me, the word ghost uh, uh, basically denotes a, a disembodied uh, uh, spirit. Or uh, it's, uh, I just, uh, Maybe it's because this channel is not charismatic, it's conservative. Uh, could be because it's, it's just a, simply an English translation. It's a translation of the English in which the word ghost is not the word in the original text. The word is spirit. It is the Holy Spirit. And it is all, note, take a serious note, folks of the fact in verse, in verse 13 that this is through the power of the Holy Spirit, not our own strength, our own power. We don't war according to the flesh. None of this is, 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 comes about as a result of our own strength. Uh, something about verse 9, and that the Gentiles might glorify God for His mercy as it is written, for this cause I will confess to thee among the Gentiles. That's the word confess there again is homilageo, to say the same thing God says. Among the Gentiles and sing unto thy name. That word sing there is, is actually the word is to play on a stringed instrument is really what the word means. I guess uh, I'm going to leave it up to you folks to decide exactly what that's talking about. Uh, I don't, uh, I'm not able to play the guitar like I used to since I broke my wrist from a horse wreck. And so, you know, I don't, uh, I don't think it very much applies to me. I don't know what, I can't honestly tell you what the Holy Spirit is trying to, to say to us here, except, or why that the, uh, the English translations translated it sing when it's play on a stringed instrument. I know I've known people that have had a problem with instruments in church. I think the text makes it absolutely clear here that there's not a problem with stringed instruments in church. So the text absolutely allows guitars or stringed instruments in worship services. Uh, but I think the, the real point here of the verse is, is that what it's saying is that God's mercy results in glory, that being a true estimation of his worth, which is uh, that, that mercy being our not getting what we do deserve, and that the praise comes out of our speaking the same thing that God says. And so as we go down and read through uh, verses 10, 11, and 12, and, and if you'll notice in verse 11, it's, uh, and again, praise the Lord, all you Gentiles, and laud him, all you people. The word laud there uh, is 
praise intensified. It's the, the same word as praise, except it's the more intense form of praise. Uh, so it's, it's really praising. And, and that totally fits the context. And so, uh, in view of the, of the strong caring for the weaker in this context, which we haven't left particularly left that context, God's desire, it is God's desire that we endure in situations we can't control, which brings us comfort. We're not to try to change one another or to adjust them to our way of thinking as it regards our faith and what we have faith, whether if we have faith to eat all things, then well, they should too. Or if we don't, if we're the weaker brother, then we should, you know, uh, criticize the, the strong brother. That unity is expressed in the realization of the finished work of Christ where an estimation of his true value is unanimously known and expressed. We see that from the text, folks. If you really look at the grammar, you'll see that, that it is an estimation of his true value, which is unanimously known and expressed. That can refer to nothing other than the finished work of Christ. And we receive one another with aggressive personal interest. Why? Because it is on that basis that Christ received us. There is no other basis upon which we receive one another. The uh, obedience of Christ on our behalf, it confirmed God's word to be trustworthy and true. That God is glorified through the mercy that he's shown us. That's how he's glorified, which is our not getting what we deserve, which is hell. And praise is expressed through our being in agreement with God, which in, in, within that agreement, uh, within the sphere of that confession, that agreement with God, is, it is praise intensified, where we're saying the same thing that God has said, which puts us in a good frame of mind. The promises of God being a result of Christ being God of very God, you see His deity in this, in this context, who raised from the dead to live forevermore. I hope that you continue to be blessed as we, we finish out our study here in Romans. I want to thank everyone who has su continued to support this ministry. We really do ap appreciate you. We appreciate your prayers, those who are praying for us. We pray for you constantly. And I love you all. I truly do. Until next time, this is Steve. Thanks for watching.